Section 9, Chapters 29 through 32. In this section, Klee and I expand on critics, rejection, and haters. We discuss our first hater and the concept of our own buttons being pushed. We go into detail about how problem solving is always better than finger pointing. Klee tells her Zeus lightning out of a finger concept and the not so good, the bad, and the ugly of the art world. We dive deep into the world of constructive criticism and trolls, and I tell a story from my childhood to expand on the concept of bullies. Haters. They're out there. Oh yeah, haters. Haters are definitely out there. (laughs) So in the next section, we're talking about the critics, the haters, and it's called Let the Critics Be Critics, which I think is a great title. Yeah, they're out there, and... Whenever you are putting yourself or your work or anything out there, uh, chances are you're going to encounter the critics. Oh, yeah. No matter what level you're at. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's basically something that you know for sure, for sure, for sure is going to happen. That if you are trying to do anything extraordinary, uh, and by extraordinary, I mean Mm extraordinary. You're not doing anything ordinary. You're doing something that is not the norm you're going to have a lot of people out there that are going to criticize you. They're going to have an opinion. Sometimes it's random people that you've never met before. Sometimes it's other people in the art world. Sometimes it's your family and friends who are sometimes well-meaning but say crazy stuff. Like one time, and my mom is very well-meaning and very supportive, but she just kind of doesn't understand art or the art world. And she was looking at one of our pieces and she was like, wow, and people actually pay you that money for that? Yeah, I remember. (laughs) I remember she did that with me with one of my sculptures. Uh huh. Do you remember your first hater encounter? I would say that my my first hater encounter actually wasn't so much a hater, but it was based on the the comment that he made. I remember the very 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 first time uh, that I was showing my art at the Museum of Contemporary Art mm-hmm. in Chicago, and a friend of mine who was also displaying some art, uh, he needed a ride. Uh, and I had, you know, an SUV, so I was able to pick him up and his artwork, and we went to go drop off the artwork, and on the way there, uh, he was looking at my art, and was like, yeah, you know, it's pretty good, it's, it's pretty good, and I was like, oh, thanks, you know, it's the first time I'm showing stuff, I'm totally nervous, yeah. and then he grabs one of my pieces, because I am also very impatient, so there was like a fingerprint, there was honestly there was a fingerprint in all of them because uh, I was just waiting for them to dry. But like he grabbed one of them and he looked so disappointed and so like uh, just distraught over this. And it was like, oh, oh, there's a fingerprint in it. Uh. And immediately my insecurity like flared up. He's like, well, you know, next time maybe you could do better. <laughs> Thanks. And it wasn't necessarily that he was a hater. He just had whatever standard he had. Mm-hmm. But considering that I was his friend and that was like the first time that I was ever putting my stuff out there, I think he could have handled that a lot better. Oh, definitely. I mean, that shows, you know, his insecurity and his newbiness to yeah. uh, doing stuff like that. My first hater was when I was in my early 20s when I was playing music in one of my bands. And um, someone wrote my band a letter claiming to be an expert in the music industry. No specifics about what type of expert we were talking about. Right. But made sure that they put in the letter, I know the music industry. I'm an expert and people respect my opinion. And then this person went person by person in my band with insults that were prepared for each of us. And the one that was prepared for me was, I don't even know what you're doing up there. I'm pretty sure they have you on stage for looks. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So, like, he uh, basically took it upon himself to write a letter to the band. To write a letter. And do a private critique. Of each of us. Because he was an expert. Yes. In who God knows what. Yes. Wrote us a letter and paid for the postage to mail it. Oh, wow. That's dedication. That's dedication to your haterism. You know, like you're you're like you're you got to be 
a dedicated hater if you're not going to get any kind of uh, feedback on that. Yeah, like, totally. To a make it public. snail mail hater. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we've we heard it all over the years. I remember when we got our first hater on YouTube, we actually celebrated because uh, it meant that we had put ourselves out there enough to get a hater. I know. I was like, yeah, this we've is awesome. Up. We've, we've made it. We've made it to, to, uh, to be able to be hated on on YouTube is an honor. Absolutely. And it's... It's hilarious because like the one thing that uh, we've been able to celebrate, uh, which, you know, and I get it, like sometimes uh, people make certain comments and it gets under your skin and that sucks. But if you're able to look at that in that way, you got to think about those people that don't put themselves out there because they're too concerned about what somebody will think, Mm -hmm. how much freedom there is in realizing like, you know what, once I make it, once I made it out in the art world and I was putting my stuff out there, I remember having the thought because um, for the most part, you get people that are like, oh, that's beautiful, you know, and that's great. But every once in a while you get somebody that's like, this is da da da, you know, they're being funny in front of their friends or whatever it is that they're doing, uh, just being stupid. And it's it's hilarious to me that um, when you start putting your stuff out there and you your mentality switches from like, I don't want anybody to say anything bad about my art to like, oh, wow, if if somebody is saying something bad about my art, it means that I've put myself out there in a way that is vulnerable, which is the only way that you can put yourself out there and really, really expand on who you are and what your market's going to be. Not only is it affirmation that you're putting yourself out there, but recently someone said something to us that I was like, yeah, that's really good stuff, what you just said, which was that there's freedom in understanding that no matter what you're doing, someone is going to dislike it. Someone's going to have a negative opinion. So it's reaffirming for yourself also Oh, I'm creating stuff that I want to create. I'm doing it for me, not for other people or what I think other people want. Because no matter what you do, there's going to be someone who doesn't like it or doesn't like you. Exactly. Exactly. I think that there that that's where the power comes in when I think about our YouTube channel. You know, like I am under the suspicion, obviously I don't have any proof of this, but I'm under the suspicion that we have at least one person that is subscribed to us simply so that he could a not watch the videos but get a notification of when the videos come out and uh hit it with a thumbs down we tend to get a thumbs down immediately immediately when the video posts and a lot of times there isn't even a view for the video with the thumbs down so in my mind i'm like wow that's uh, dedication yeah that is total dedication and it also affirms that it has absolutely nothing to do with what i'm putting out there me or my material this person has taken it on themselves upon themselves to basically make this one of the small missions that they have in life for whatever reason Mm -hmm. for, for whatever thing that they disagreed with me on or whatever point of view i had and so they are adamantly standing against it so it's almost like i gave them a mission yeah, you know, a and, purpose. And I'm like, wow, you know, you're welcome. Motivations come from all sorts of places. Some people just don't have a filter and they just say whatever's on their mind, right. kind of like your dad, which I adore him for that. Some people have a grudge, like you said or did something that rubbed them the wrong way and now they're on a mission, like our very dedicated YouTube hater. Right. Um, some people are just angry. I had a guy that at a show he was having a bad day, clearly. He just wanted to fight with me about the fact that I love the city of Chicago. Right. He just was so pissed about it. You could tell he was like, he was getting all red. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to trade insults. I wasn't engaging. Uh, eventually, he just said his last word and walked off. And I was like, that was so very confusing. It, um, but you just never know where someone's at. It is it is very, very interesting. And I think what makes it even more interesting is that a lot of times these these things that are that are significant to the person that's saying it, but really not all that significant to you because it really doesn't have anything to do with you, uh, whether or not they agree with you or disagree. But where, again, it goes back to the comparison game where I talk about, like, why is your focus on what someone else's opinion is 
because ultimately that opinion is theirs and has everything to do with them. And so like when you get a hater, this hater is like uh, their focus is on you because of something that you said, something you created, something that you did that is more so a reflection of maybe somewhere where their insecurities lie, you know, like you're putting your stuff out there and they're looking at it. It's like, well, that stuff's not even good. And then they get upset about it because you're selling stuff and you're putting your stuff out there and really has nothing to do with whether or not your stuff is any good. It has to do with the fact that now they're comparing uh, maybe their art to yours and they have not put themselves out there. And so now they're they're upset with you because you're not following the status quo of the way that things are supposed to be. They're patiently waiting to put their stuff out there and you're just willy-nilly putting your stuff out there and making a career of it. Yes, and there might be a sense in their mind that you don't deserve whatever it is that you're achieving or getting. Exactly. But really they feel bad about their lack of uh, putting it out there. Yeah. And... Um, it's it's uh, putting yourself out there is scary um facing haters and critics is scary it's basically making yourself vulnerable as Brene Brown beautifully put it uh vulnerability can be a source of shame and fear I'm paraphrasing here but can also be a source of great joy absolutely and so the choice yeah. between being vulnerable and putting yourself out there versus not and having regret um, I'll take the vulnerability, and I love the man in the arena quote for yeah. that reason. Um, and I'm not going to quote it because you you say it, you quote it in the book, and but I just think it's one of the most powerful things I've ever heard about putting yourself out there. Absolutely. And the thing about it is that, like, when when you look at the way that society uh, responds to things, right? Especially when it comes to things that are creative. Everyone has an opinion, mm -hmm. right? And usually everyone voices their opinion very loudly when they disagree with something. So you take a, a creative, something creative uh, recently that a lot of people were voicing their opinion on, right? Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, you have a bunch of creative, uh, it, it's a creative collaboration between directors, actors, uh, people in film editors, all this stuff, musicians, everybody comes together to create something, mm -hmm. right? And put it out there. It is basically a big, massive work of art. Now, this is a work of art that is geared towards the general public, not just people that like art, people that like that theme, the fantasy theme, that is their audience, right? And you have a bunch of people that are out there basically being the critics saying, you know, even going as far as like putting together a... Uh, fundraising campaign to try and raise money to get them to redo the last episode of Game of Thrones. Right. Right. And what's interesting about that is that a lot of us don't look at that and think of it as being a, a negative critic. Right. And yet you got to think of all the hard work and all the stuff, all the, all the effort that they put into making those last episodes the way that they, they wanted it to be. Mm hmm. And simply because you disagree with the ending, you are assuming that it's bad. Whatever emphasis it has on you, basically, when it comes to the storyline and the way that the storyline was going to be, um, you know, you either look at it and you're like, well, that was that was pretty good. Or like, well, I wish it would have been different or uh, that that's horrible. I, this needs to be changed. And it's almost like the people will take it personal that the people that created something created what they created that they disagree with. Mm -hmm. And so, again, has nothing to do with the people that created the Game of Thrones stuff. They they did the best job that they possibly could. And But when you get the general public to disagree with something, and then they start saying some really horrible stuff. Yeah, and it's like the degree to which they're angry is the degree to which they're personally offended by whatever they're witnessing, and it has more to do with where they're at. Some people took it upon themselves to write their own fan fiction ending for Game of Thrones. Which I think is awesome. Yeah. I think that's awesome, because then you're taking, you're taking that energy and you're pouring it into creativity not totally. simply just criticizing making a ruckus on social media yeah let's talk for a moment about buttons this was a hugely awesome thing that i've realized over the years is that some comments roll right off you like dude who was super mad that i love the city of chicago i was like i don't know where you're at but 
I hope the rest of your day goes better. Right. Um, but then sometimes someone says something and it really gets you. Right. Like it gets under your skin. And you talk about in the book how that's a prime opportunity to realize, oh, that's a button. Right. Meaning that's an insecurity. If it bothers me, it means I am i don't have a solid foundation when it comes to this thing. Right. I may be slightly insecure when it comes to this thing. Right. Um, it means that somewhere inside of you, uh, there is a, a tiny voice that might sort of agree with the statement mm-hmm. uh, that happened, that it might be part of your negative self-talk. And so you've got this person that is coming and they're reaffirming this thing that you're trying not to believe about yourself. But now it's like, how does he know? How does he know <laughs> that I'm this, these things? Absolutely. So a great example is like um, the the example you cite in the book where the guy is like, I don't know why she talks so much in the background. I was right. like, that's hilarious. That bothers me. Not at all. Clearly, you don't get the whole MO of our channel. Right. Um, there was another commenter that criticized the fact that it looks like I have no eyebrows. That one got under my skin because I am have been a little self-conscious about how thin and lightly colored my eyebrows are. <laughs> and I realized like, oh, that's that's an insecurity I should look at. I should try to love my eyebrows more because I don't want to feel this way if someone says something about my eyebrows. That's hilarious. I love that. I love that about you because like you get one person that's like, you're a woman. Why, is, why are you speaking, woman? And then you got someone else who's like, your eyebrows are non-existent and you're like oh, my eyebrows because <laughs> i'm secure in my ability to speak on our channel and i'm right. like that dude uh clearly is from a different era all i could think of when we got the comment of like why does she talk so much in the video she should sit there and be quiet i was like i feel sorry for you dude because whatever relationship you ever get into it's just gonna That's suck it's gonna go That's sideways a horrible on you relationship I started really realizing I needed to look at my own buttons, having gotten to know and love your dad, because your dad has no filter, and he just says whatever he thinks, and there have been a few occasions where he said something that just made me so mad, and I realized he had pushed a button. He had touched on an insecurity. He is amazing for that. You know, it's hilarious, because like a lot of the videos when I'm talking about my dad, you know, my dad hates my art, or he hates (laughs) this, or whatever, and I have a feeling that a lot of people, that a lot of people that respond to those videos are like, oh, I can't believe that he did that and blah, blah, you know, like, um, and even have tried to insult him when in actuality, my dad is amazing. I was just, and I try to explain that in the videos, like he's amazing. When he was looking at a painting at uh, the Contemporary Art Museum, and he was slapping the painting and saying that it looked like throw up, it wasn't that he was saying that the painting sucked. He was just stating. He this was comparing painting, it. Yeah, this painting looks like throw up the texture and coloration yeah (laughs) yeah reminded him which he followed up immediately with putting his arm around you and asking if you wanted to go get a drink at the bar exactly i adore your father he's one of my favorite people on earth and he says whatever he's thinking and i appreciate that about him he says it with love yeah. He's coming from a good place every time. He's been a huge source of allowing me to investigate my buttons and why I might feel insecure about this particular thing and work through those things. Well, he doesn't he doesn't have an ulterior motive underneath. And I think that that's the difference. Now, if I am dealing with some kind of insecurity within myself, you know, like dad walks into the studio and I've got a bunch of abstracts in the background and he looks over and he's just voicing his opinion of like, oh, you're still doing those paintings that look like nothing, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so like if I was insecure about uh, whether or not I was an artist or whatever, whatever situation it was when it came to my art, that comment would bother me. Of course. And because I'm not insecure, of course it doesn't bother me. I just kind of smile and look at him. I'm like, yes, dad. Yes. We know you like nudes and horses. (laughs) Um, And so the takeaway is you don't have to take anything personally. It is a good opportunity to look at your insecurities and see if there's a button that you can maybe neutralize. Right. Um, You've taken to just saying thank you. Uh, no matter if it's positive or negative feedback, yes. because they took the time to put their focus on us for a moment. Yeah, I, you know, on YouTube, there are times where I will delete the comment, but I delete the comment more so because I don't want my channel to become that thing mm-hmm. where like people are arguing in the 
in the comment section. Yeah. Like if somebody's going to go on there and they're going to publicly state something stupid uh, that that doesn't there's a lot of people that leave negative comments under and I leave the negative comments because it opens up room for debate. But if somebody's just being stupid, usually I'll just delete them because I'm like, I don't I don't want to involve our YouTube following with idiots. That Things are that out are there. completely non-constructive that has, they won't serve no purpose for debate. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So these methods, not taking it personally, investigating if you have a button, if you had an emotional response, is kind of the opposite of when they tell you to build a thick skin and you hear that thrown around the art world so oh, yeah. much. You got you to gotta build a thick skin, which to me, and you illustrate this in the book, and I agree that building a thick skin is more like putting up barriers and even putting on armor. Yeah. Um, and... That signifies to me that you're not actually investigating anything within yourself. You're just dismissing it. Which, if somebody's being a total jerk face, absolutely dismiss them. Right. But if you had an adverse emotional reaction to it, I think investigating where that's coming from and maybe rewriting that narrative, was we talk so much about, is the opposite of putting up armor. Absolutely. I think the idea of like, you got to grow thick skin is just one of those sayings that's been thrown around for so long that people just kind of believe it without, without thinking actually about it and what that actually means. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that if you have a button or an insecurity or something that's within you and uh, it doesn't matter where it came from, maybe in your childhood, your, uh, one of your parents said you had no common sense, you have no common sense, you have no common sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then someone says you have no common sense and you either have a thick skin and you're like, oh, this rolls off behind me. But you still kind of push it down it still hurts. within you because it still hurts. Mm -hmm. You've just gotten numb to the pain. Right. That's really what growing a thick skin means is that you get numb to the pain. And the idea isn't to get numb to the pain. The idea is to eliminate the cause of the pain which the cause of the pain isn't your parents telling you that you have no common sense it's you rewriting that narrative for yourself so that when someone does say you have no common sense it doesn't mean anything to you if somebody came up to me and said oh you're so bald you know i'd be like y yes i am <laughs> this is like, correct like what what do you want me to do? i'm not gonna it'd be like somebody coming up to you and and calling you a, a brunette when you're not a brunette and be like, your brunette hair is blah, 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 blah. You'd kind of look at them like they were an idiot. Like, uh, no. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same thing can happen with a lot of the insecurities that we have, but we really do have to face them. Whenever you grow thick skin, you are not, you are not facing the cause of the pain. You're not taking a look at those buttons. You're simply building armor over yourself to protect those areas that you know it, a lot of people call them scars they're like i have these scars from my childhood mm -hmm. and what i think a lot of people overlook like they say these things because they've heard them before it is a common thing to say you i've got scars from my past i've got this but when you stop and you actually think about it scars heal and it's not like a scar stays open as a as a as a, a wound, a gaping wound. They heal over time. And yes, you have this little bit of a reminder there, but essentially your scars do heal. Instead of building like a piece of armor that is gonna sit over this gaping wound that you are just consistently gonna keep open instead of allowing it to heal, I'm saying heal the scar so that the next time it happens it's not it's not going to be painful exactly so in your example of the common sense right you were told not you but you is the example we're told as a kid you don't have common sense someone says that to you you believe it's true it hurts you uh it's not so much in blowing that off or getting numb to it it's in looking at that history do i believe i have no common sense right if so why why do I believe that? What does that even mean? What does that mean to have common sense? Right. And going down that route of investigation, I was told I had no common sense all the time. It used to get under my skin a little when people would say stuff like that. Common sense is like general knowledge. I yeah. have plenty of it. Yeah. I don't need to be bothered by that commentary. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, if you are alive, then you have common sense. Yes. That's, that's that, you know, that's that pretty as easy as it is. If you didn't have common sense, 
then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about problem solving versus finger pointing. Yes. And this can be a really difficult one for people. It was difficult for me because I spent a long time blaming other people. Uh, It's kind of a common thing that if we're feeling hurt, someone hurt us. It's their fault. Oh, yeah. Um, If, If we're feeling limited... It's because someone's limiting us. The The reason that I put this uh, this particular part of the chapter in is because not only, A, will this help you in your just your life, your general perspective in life, but also uh, the majority of my life of me not putting myself out there had to do with finger pointing. Mm-hmm. I was finger pointing at the gatekeepers. I was finger pointing at it, basically using everyone else, blaming everyone else for why it was that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I blamed my art teacher. I blamed whoever it was that I was in a relationship with that mm-hmm. wasn't supportive. I blamed my kids. I blamed the gatekeepers. I blamed the system. I blamed society. I blamed uh, secret cabals i mean there is all kinds of stuff like you you spend all your time blaming someone else for the circumstance that you're in that you don't actually take care of your own circumstances or do something about it because you consistently have an excuse on why you're not doing it by finger pointing absolutely and the simplest way for me to look at this especially when there are times where i want to blame somebody in that moment it feels easier and better let's just use the example of haters somebody says something horrible to me i want to blame that person for how i feel right um and yes they're a jerk for saying it maybe actually finger pointing doesn't do anything for me uh and conversely taking responsibility for how i feel isn't for their sake i like to look at it as wherever you're pointing your finger it's like zeus right? Like you picture a stream of your own power coming out the tip of your finger and wherever you're pointing it, that's where your power is going. Right. So you're pointing at someone and saying it's your fault. Essentially, you're giving the power away to them. It means that they have control over how you feel, not you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that that is why it's so important because we are so used to dealing with situations where we feel like a victim all the time and there are a lot of like really crappy situations out there yeah where maybe somebody is feeling victimized and they are in fact being victimized by someone or and absolutely they, you shouldn't take that or they have been victimized by someone when they were a kid a, a lot of people will use these things and, and i hate saying it because i don't want to be insensitive but like i've had horrible horrible stuff happened to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. And for a very, very long time in my life, I used those things that happened in my past as excuses. The people that did things to me, I blamed them for my life. And because of that, then my life, wherever I was, the people that were around me, I blamed them for the situation and why I was in my life. And essentially, just like you said, like you're handing your power away and you don't give yourself the opportunity to make choices for yourself because everything is based on, I need to make this choice because of this person, this person, this person, but I am worried about making this choice because of this person and this person and this person. Absolutely. So everything in your life is based on what they're doing and not what you want in uh, your life. A great example of that is for me also, like I wanted to blame my father and the, the relationship I had with my father for the fact that I had a hard time trusting romantic partners, had had a hard time trusting men. Right. Well, me putting up those walls and lack of trust wasn't hurting my father. Exactly. <laughs> it was hurting me. Uh, It it wasn't hurting anyone but me. Yeah, it was creating conflict in the relationship, but those dudes pieced out and moved on. Yeah. It was my issue, and I I understood that until I could stop holding that pain inside, essentially, I needed to stop blaming him, not for his sake, but because I don't want to carry him around in my heart anymore so that I can move on. And decide what's best for me. And that's that's the, the simple truth when you break it down to the very, very core of it. Is that if your attention, if your reasoning for doing things 
in any way, shape, or form are blamed on someone else, at that point, you are completely and utterly giving away any sense of direction and power that you would have for yourself. And so, like, a lot of us feel justified in blaming, holding grudges, um, uh, using other people as an excuse on why it is that we can't do this. You know, I've, I've, I, in my life, I've even used like, well, you know, my, my parents never taught me to be this way or my parents, you know, they didn't set a good example when it came to this. And so this is why I'm like this. It's like, we have all these justifications and they sound really, really good on paper. Mm -hmm. But when you break them down, it's like, it's, it's just not good enough. It's not good enough of an excuse to me, at least where I'm at in my life now, it is just not good enough of an excuse uh, to blame someone else for anything that makes me feel like I have no control over it now. Because it's a trap. Exactly. Blame is a trap. You hold yourself stuck in a place where you can't move forward. Exactly. Um, and I wrote myself a little note here, um, taking responsibility versus taking blame. It's not like you need to internalize the blame and blame yourself. It's like in those shows where a crappy situation is happening and you've got like three, four people dealing with it and you've got like one person who's trying to find a solution for the issue and you've got another person who's just like freaking out and blaming the rest of the people right. standing, you know, like um, just basically creating conflict on top of conflict right. instead of looking for a solution. So in my mind, it's no, you don't internalize the blame. Responsibility is like, what do I need to do? To exactly. move forward. Exactly. Because I think I I think that at first, like for somebody who like, let's say they're listening to this and this concept, they're like, huh, huh, let me let me think about that. Mm -hmm. I think at first, if you are somebody who's used to throwing blame around, mm -hmm. right, uh, and blaming other people for the circumstance that you're in or the situation that you're in and you're blaming this person and blaming that person, um, a lot of times your automatic reaction is because someone needs to be blamed for what's happening is to turn the blame in on yourself. Right. Which is totally not productive. Exactly. It's not productive at all because blame, blaming someone for something or holding a grudge, whether it's you or someone else is never going to solve an issue. It's never going to get you past whatever stagnant place you're sitting in. So like taking ownership, taking responsibility, Taking ownership of your life is one of the main things. If you're in a shitty situation, then what can I do right now to get myself out of this shitty situation and be able to move forward? Or do I have an exit strategy? What can I do? If you're busy blaming the other person for the situation, you've got no control there. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said before, like I understand there, there people are going through some crappy stuff. I've gone through some really, really crappy stuff yeah. in my life, but it wasn't until I took ownership of my life and decided like, you know what? I, I don't need this person yeah. to, 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 to blame for this. And I'm not going to blame myself. This is a crappy situation. What can I do to get myself out of this? Absolutely. I was highly resistant to letting go of blame, especially in certain circumstances where something was very painful until I realized, like, basically, I'm just carrying that pain, that person, those memories around in my body. So this idea of letting go of blame is for me. Right. It's to clear the space because I don't have storage room for that kind of toxic feeling. Right. And so for myself, I hyphenated blame and to be lame um, because to blame <laughs> is to sort of be lame, meaning to immobilize yourself. Exactly. The one thing I didn't mention in this book was forgiveness mm -hmm. because I didn't want to uh, go down the route. A lot of people talk about forgiveness and forgiveness is very uh, mixed up in the way that people understand it. Like a lot of times, you know, it's like they think that it's about the other person that's being forgiven when in actuality, it's all about you mm -hmm. letting go. Uh, I love that there's a quote by Buddha where he talks about uh, forgiveness and letting go that when you're holding on to blame or holding on to hatred for someone else or resentment, that it's like holding on to a hot coal. Like you're looking at the other person, but you're the one that's hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so true. And given my experience with this subject, like it just changed my life. 
being able to like let go of all those things that I didn't even realize were just crutches that I was holding on to to keep myself in a perpetual state of being a victim to the circumstance or the person or whatever it was, no matter how much I grew and evolved and experienced in life, it was like I had this one thing that, like you said, like I was just lame. I was just holding on to it. Mm -hmm. And the ability to move on and then be able to set my focus on things that really do matter, that really I do have control over, just completely and utterly changed so many aspects of my life that I, I can't even picture myself going back to blaming someone else for my situation or for the way I feel ever again. Because you don't want to feel that. No. In the next section, you talk about the not so good, the bad, and the ugly, where you go more in depth about art world bullies, life world bullies, critics, haters, trolls, and how... It's widely understood, especially now, that people who are critical, people that are trying to hurt other people emotionally, physically, in any way, uh, they're not in a good state. No. Those people are usually in pain of some sort, uh, have probably been bullied or felt like a victim, uh, and usually it's lashing out. Oh, yeah. What you're dealing with there is a sense of control. When somebody is being bullied, it's because the other person wants to control the situation. And so what we sometimes forget is that that person, that person that's bullying someone had to have learned that method somewhere. Like, this is how I gain control of a situation. Uh, this is what makes me better. I need to be better and stronger than this person in order to feel good about myself. Absolutely. I've been a bully for a short time in my life. I was a bully yeah. because I was bullied. I felt picked on all the time. I felt helpless and like I had no control. So for a short time in my early adulthood, I found it easier to be mean, critical, and unapproachable than to be vulnerable and open to the world. Oh, absolutely. And so I was harsh. I thought I was smarter than everyone in the room. I basically was that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've experienced the same thing. You know, I was I was like the smartest guy in the room. And I basically I was the killer of dreams. If people came to me and they were excited about some project that they were working on, I was so miserable in my life. And the only way that I knew how to make myself feel better was by being better than everyone else, at mm -hmm. least in my own uh, stupid head, thinking that I was being better than everybody else because I was able to put them down. I could put you down. That makes you dumb and you're not better than I am because I'm better than you because I'm pointing out this thing that you're so flawed at. And really, it's it's all insecurity, all insecurity. I am such a different person than I was back then because I am actually happy. I am actually uh, all about taking a good look at what is going on with me and having a better relationship with myself. And that's the thing about somebody who's willing to troll or bully or be whatever. You can't give to anyone else what you don't have for yourself. So if someone is being a bully and someone is saying some really nasty crap to you, chances are that this person says even worse stuff to themselves all the time. It's very likely. It doesn't mean you have to put up with it, no. but it does give you perspective. Yeah. A lot of times I, I have a ring. Uh, and again, I'm going back to the pointer finger. I have a rose quartz ring that I'll wear on my pointer finger sometimes, especially out at events and social situations where I know I might encounter any number of things. I wear a rose quartz ring on my pointer finger because rose quartz is the stone of compassion. And it's simply, I do it to remind myself if some stuff is happening, if someone's being a jerk or I'm perceiving them as being a jerk, uh, don't throw stones. Right. Just try to exercise some, some compassion. Things catch you off guard all the time. Try to assess the situation first. Yeah. Sometimes people are just in pain. Well, and you know what's interesting about that is that uh, so a lot of times when somebody says something nasty, uh, the, the automatic reaction, because let's say they push at one of your insecurities and it just you, you get upset and you get defensive and you want to argue back. Mm -hmm. And really the best uh, way is to just ignore it. Yeah. You know, and you get that advice from so many people. And obviously, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to do because like, you know, you hear this comment and it hit on it touched on an insecurity and now you're like ruminating on it. Uh, but really, 
the it's all a power play. It's all a, a, a controlling power play. And this is why it goes back to uh, blaming other people, because essentially it's this power play that you're playing with someone. And when you do blame them, which is what usually happens in the victim bully relationship, mm -hmm. you are handing all your power away to this person that you feel like a victim to. And that becomes the basis of the relationship, which makes them feel more powerful and you feel more weak. In this section, you outline four types of critics, and I won't cover them all because obviously it is in the book and right. they're, they're all well explained. But I wanted to touch on the constructive critic. Right. Because um, sometimes somebody really is trying to be helpful, and generally you get a sense of that. But I know some artists that they cannot take any form of criticism, even if it's constructive criticism. Right. And the knee-jerk response is to just get super defensive and argumentative and spiteful. Oh, yeah. And so it's good to take a moment to assess yeah. where is someone coming from. I've definitely been there. And the only reason that I'm not still there is because I've questioned a lot of my own insecurities. You're getting out there. You're putting your artwork out there, let's say, for the first time. You're sharing your work with the world. Uh, you've told yourself all these stories about how that's being vulnerable and how that's hard because these are my babies and these are a part of me and da da da. And so like you've you've overemphasized this story that is very common out there of if anyone says anything about these pieces, it's going to destroy me. Mm -hmm. And so like you're already setting the stage for the situation to occur. So the moment that someone even comes up and says anything that is even remotely constructive but still kind of touches at those buttons, you've already set the stage for this huge uh, situation to happen. So somebody comes up, says something constructive, and immediately you're like, I don't need to hear you, da 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 And you respond to everybody the same. Mm -hmm. And really what ends up happening in situations like that is that you do become unapproachable, you put walls up, and eventually no one really wants to interact with you. Right. Because even the people that admire your art and maybe say something about a p I've seen artists do this where somebody will come in, look at a piece of art and say, like, so I feel like this piece is da 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 da. And they'll explain what the piece means to them. Mm -hmm. And the artist will be like, well, that's not what I intended when I created it. They right. get they get really upset. At that point, the conversation's over. Yeah, the conversation's over, and and the person is not going to take that piece home because now it has a different context to them. Absolutely, criticism in any form, definitely constructive criticism, but even some non-constructive criticism, I'm I'm try I try. We're humans, right? Right. I try to ask myself, is there something here for me? Yes. To learn. I had a lady leave me a terrible review online once that she was horribly disappointed with a pair of earrings because they were so much smaller than she thought they were going to be. This was early on in the online shopping days for me. Right. And um, while I don't feel like she handled it appropriately because she didn't reach out to me to see if we could resolve the issue. And she was very, clearly very angry and very, this is what you get for shopping online. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Very throwing stones. The takeaway was, well, there is something here for me. Uh, even though I did put the dimensions of said earrings in my description, understanding that she couldn't get the scale because I had no way of modeling them back. I wasn't showing them on a model right. for scale purposes. I decided that moment all my jewelry is going to be modeled in some way, shape, or form so there's no mistake about scale. Exactly. So that was my takeaway, and I was better for it. Right. And more equipped to handle that kind of thing. That right there opens up a conversation about situations where sometimes people are just frustrated. Yeah. You know, you don't know what this woman's uh, whole week was or what her last 10 experiences were buying stuff online mm -hmm. and how there's a possibility that so far everything that she tried buying online just just was not what she wanted. And when it came to you, you were the last straw. So she left this review. Could be. I think about an experience that I had when, when I was managing the theater, right? There was a, a man, that one day a man comes out and he's just full, like his hair, his shoulders, everything just full of like gummy worms and gummy bears. <laughs> it was very clear that somebody had just dropped a bucket of candy on his head. So he came out, he's like, um, there's a woman in here that is just 
she's screaming or whatever. And I get, go in the theater and sure enough, she is losing it. She's like, I just want to be left alone. Da, 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 da. So I asked her to come out. And what had happened was that there were three people in the theater. Uh, she sat down and this gentleman sat down a row behind her because it was like the center of the theater. And she did not want anyone around her. And the reason for this was she was a teacher and she had been having a really bad week with some really aggressive kids in her class. And at some point she decided the only thing I want to do is just go watch a movie and just sit there by myself. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone around me. I'm going to go in the middle of the afternoon when no one goes to the theater so I could just sit in the theater. I just want to be by myself. So this gentleman unknowingly entered her her, her personal, her space, personal bubble. space bubble by sitting in one of the seats behind her and she lost it. And it had nothing to do with him. It had nothing to do with the theater. It had to do with the story, with the narrative that was being told in that moment. Mm hmm. What's interesting is if you look at that situation on the surface, all you see is somebody who lost it and dropped some gummy bears on some dude's head, mm -hmm. right? But when you actually take that time to really, really understand that humans are complex creatures and sometimes somebody is just acting out of character and sometimes somebody that's just a character that they're used to playing. Yeah. But most times, even when it's a, an aggressor, it is in some way, shape, or form attached to being like a feeling like a victim. Bullies are victims in their lives. That's why the moment you stand up to a bully, they usually back down. Mm -hmm. The thing is that at the core of it here, that's why it goes back to all of us. How many times have I behaved like a bully in my life because I was insecure? Right, or having an off day. Or having an off day. Yeah. It's just really understanding that, man, in those situations, it has nothing to do with the other person. It could have been anyone. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was going to say something mean or whatever because of where I was at in that moment because I was frustrated in my life with something that was completely unrelated. And then I took it out on this person. And understanding that when people do that to you, it has nothing to do with you. And again, this is for you. So did that teacher act appropriately at the theater? No. No. Obviously not. You don't want to reinforce that behavior by saying, it's okay. It's totally okay that you did that. It's not for them. No. We're talking about an exercise in compassion, which I think is a good thing. Trying to understand where people are coming from but also so that you don't enter that power struggle with them. Right. I mean, it, it was the conversation that I had with that particular lady. I said, ma'am, I'm going to need you to calm down unless you want to be escorted out of the theater in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And I am sorry that you are feeling this way, but this is completely inappropriate behavior. And I think at that moment, like she realized what was going on because she was so stuck in her narrative that I don't think she was even seeing what was going on. And then she burst out into tears. And that's where she was like, I just wanted a day. Yeah, I just wanted a day. And then that's where compassion was able to come in because it wasn't like, listen, what you did, that's fine. No, it's like that was kind of a, 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 a jerk move. Mm -hmm. What you just did. I get it. I understand where you were at. Try not to allow yourself to go there anymore because obviously it's not a good reflection of this very, very nice person that is sitting in front of me right now who is just having a really frustrating week. Compassion is not reciprocating that that negative energy. Right. And, you know, in the case of people who really are just out to piss other people off, trolls, basically. Right. Don't feed the trolls, don't, as you say in the book. Don't, don't feed into it. Don't feed into it. And I mean, I I, uh, I think I'm qualified to write about this because one of my daughters is actually a troll. A self-proclaimed one, <laughs> it yeah. It is the most annoying thing in the world. And the hilarious thing about a troll that is out there trolling somebody's page and doing stuff, they're not even doing it because they mean whatever it is that they're saying they're doing it because they want to incite emotion. So their sense of power comes from getting the attention mm -hmm. from making the comment. It has nothing to do with the comment, which is hilarious to me because a lot of people that are on the other end of that are going to feel the burn of that comment yes. when in actuality the troll in of themselves knowingly don't care. They don't think about it. They don't care at all what the response is to it as long as there is a response. Exactly. Yeah. 
It's interesting. The next section is how to deal with conflict. And I love this. We had done a video on conflict. It was inspired by an awesome question. And this is something that we think and talk about a lot because my conflict resolution measures and your conflict resolution measures have come from different places, but kind of meet in the middle, especially the longer we spend time together. And I love the list that you compiled here because... Part of it comes from your experience with your two grandfathers who could not be more opposite from one another. Oh, yeah. Part of it comes from my life experiences and things that I've picked up along the way. And part of it obviously comes from your life experiences and things you've picked up along the way. But red flame versus blue flame occurred to us. In a, as a way to describe your two grandfathers. Yeah. And the one that was ultimately more intimidating, the one you really didn't want to mess with, was the, was the one who was calmer. The calm one. Yeah. 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 Because uh, I had one grandfather who suffered from short man syndrome. It was just really loud and always arguing. And he would get physical. He was not as terrifying as my other grandfather, who, if he got upset, he got really quiet and that was terrifying because that man was just not somebody that you wanted to get angry. The other one was angry all the time. So it didn't matter. Yeah, it didn't even matter. Your blue flame grandfather was kind, generous, full of wisdom, and I know you adored him. Yes. But they also called him the mule because he could knock a man out with one punch, exactly. like a mule kick. Exactly. And it took a lot to, p- to test his patience. Yes. He did not anger quickly. Right. But if you did cross him and things got quiet, you knew you were in for it. Yeah, you were in for it. Whereas my other grandfather was constantly just yelling and yelling and yelling and screaming and shaking his arms and jumping up and up and down and calling people names and, you know, being mean. And he was critical and he was hyper this and hyper that. And it just was uh, what he believed was his personality. He wasn't intimidating. He wasn't scary, nor did I find him interesting. Sure. My other grandfather, on the other hand, was a poet and a musician, and he was a hustler in a bar, you know, like he would shoot pool, a pool shark, a pool shark. and like there, he was a ladies' man, and he enjoyed uh, his whiskey, and he was happy all the time. And so, like, there, there was just this, this standard of living that I would look at. Whereas one grandfather was calm and enjoyed his life. And the other grandfather was hyped up all the time and always, always complaining, bitching, moaning about something. Yeah. Blue flame grandfather had better stuff to do than yell at people all day. Yes, exactly. Um, And so you, from an early age, uh, you know, you would go to your grandfather all red flamed out about something Uh and he would say to you, Eso no es nada. Yeah, eso no es nada. That, 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 which translates to, ah, that's nothing. Yeah, which would make you even more red flamed oh, yeah. out at the time. Yeah. But because you adored and respected him so much, you sort of adopted that blue flame persona as a teenager, as an early adult. I did. You know, um, to be honest with you, I, I think a lot of my persona because when you'd look at you know we'd we'd call the Perez family was known for being like my red flame grandfather everybody argued everybody was loud everybody you know right the one who wins is the one who can yell the loudest exactly exactly so like that was just kind of the environment that I grew up in and yet there was my my other grandfather who was the complete opposite of that I'm not a very loud person so I never really won any arguments, <laughs> you know, but like what I noticed, what I started to notice was that my behavior was just not getting me anywhere in life as far as how I felt. And I think little by little, the more that I observed my my grandfather and realized that all these like loud, big men that were all loud or whatever, they got quiet when he spoke. Sure. He didn't have to speak over anyone. He just spoke. And, and they shut up. Yeah, and they shut up. I, I And I love the imagery and the reason we like the blue flame, red flame representation so much is because the red flame 
uh, is big, usually. Red flames, you know, like you look at a bonfire, there's a lot happening. Red yeah. flames are big. There's a lot going on. It seems like dangerous. And it, and it is, uh, you know, you don't want to put your hand in there. Right. Uh, and blue flames are typically smaller and more contained. They don't flicker around as much, but they're hotter. Yes. And far more dangerous. Yes. You don't want to put your hand there. And I sure. think I think that it really, it really, uh, in my life, and just not only with experiences with my family, but like having experiences with other humans throughout my life, and taking a look at this duality and dynamic within me, and realizing that me personally, I didn't want to be a hothead. I didn't want to go out there and lose my temper. Um, you know, you do stupid things when you're a hothead. Absolutely. You, you hurt your hand and then you punch a wall because you're angry. Like, it's it's really dumb. It's and that's, counterproductive. That's stuff that my family, people in my family have done and I've done when I was younger because, like, you got nowhere. You basically have this anger that is just out there, just wild, just ready to burn whatever comes near it instead of it being contained and analyzed and looked at and realizing like that's not going to get me anywhere Mm -hmm. also you've said that you sound really stupid when you get mad yes and me too yes um most of us sound pretty stupid when we get mad and we yell a lot of us our voices get all high pitched and we're like yeah actually it's great because whenever i do find myself getting mad and my voice and i raise my voice i sound so stupid to myself that it's a total pattern interrupt which so is it great pulls me out of that moment so the red flame and blue flame which is kind of it's i feel like that's the overarching thing of the whole conflict resolution is red flame or blue flame and maybe you need some red flame moments here and there oh, yeah. you know a little red flame to really like if you're in a situation where you need to red flame out then by all means red flame out but um i've i've tried to practice more blue flame and real quick i wanted to go over the other things that you listed here uh, that we've come up with, that we've learned over the years. Right. And a big one is stay connected. Don't isolate yourself. If you are, if you're being bullied, if you're in a crappy situation, or even if you're bullying yourself, or if there's any difficult thing that you're going through, there's this general propensity with some folks, myself included, to isolate. Yeah. Which for me has never done much of anything. When you look at those situations where there is maybe uh, an unhealthy uh, circumstance going on, Mm -hmm. the person uh, tends to be in a situation where they will self-isolate. It makes them feel like they have no way out. And what that will actually do is that the person who is the bully in the relationship, um, that's just another way of getting more power. Absolutely. Uh, and then it perpetuates the cycle. I think the people that you surround yourself with, it's so important. And if you have toxic people in your life, think about getting them out of yes. your life and have a good support network of awesome people. Um, a completely unexpected benefit for us of starting the Patreon uh, thing that we do and our rogue artist family is that we didn't realize it when we launched Patreon, but we've created like this ridiculously awesome support network of yeah. super creative, talented, wonderful people. Yeah. From, and from all around the world. And it benefits everyone. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, don't be a balloon, be a human. Yep. <laughs> that was a cleism of like, don't, don't allow yourself in a conflict situation to get deflated. People that belittle other people that try to deflate other people in order to win an argument or whatever the motive is, um, they piss me off more than most things. Right. Um, But you don't have to allow yourself to be deflated, especially if you understand someone's trying to to do this. This is how they know how to win an argument, by deflating or or enraging you, Uh, overinflating you. Again, because in most cases, an argument is nothing more than a power play that is going back and forth. So if somebody tries to deflate you, it is simply a power move. It's the same thing that happens when somebody says a last word and then they walk out of the room. They storm out of the room. That's power a move. power move. Totally. And so when it comes to arguing, like that's all arguments are. They're just power moves going back and forth uh, to see, you know, it's not even about being right. It's about being the one that stands in, in their 
in their most power and their most confidence or whatever it is that you want to call it at the time. But really all it comes down to is the pettiness of wanting to feel in control of another person because you don't feel like you're in control of your life. Absolutely. I would argue that all human interaction is a power exchange, is an energy exchange. In the case of conflict, it is a power struggle. Yeah. And you don't have to give your power away. Yeah. And what sucks about that is that both sides lose. Yeah. In the in those conflicts, the both sides lose. There is nothing that they are giving each other. Even if someone takes away someone else's power, it it's an illusion. So they walk away and they have to do it again. They have to find someone else to belittle in order to make themselves feel better. Absolutely. So the next one is um, set boundaries and limits and practice how you respond. And I, I learned to do this. I don't always react the way that I want to in the moment. So what I always try to do is go back and say to myself, how would I have liked to respond if I had right. it to do over again? Whether or not the situation presents itself in the same or similar way again, who knows? But um, I've had enough uh, stuff over the years to realize it's better for me to practice what would I have loved to do or say? Right. A lot of people sit there and ruminate and replay, replay the argument, replay the, the interaction, replay this, replay that. And really, all you got to do is just look at it at least one time and say, OK, this is how it happened. Uh, I'm walking away from the situation, not feeling that great. How could I do that better next time? And just prepare yourself for the next time and, and do the, the role play. Use your virtual reality engine to play it out another way. Now, if you find yourself in an imaginary argument, then you're not you're not being productive. Then you realize like, oh, there is some there's some stuff going on. Yeah, here. this is all about walking away feeling empowered without having to put someone else down. And I'm going to skip from here to practice not just the words, but the feelings, because this is so important. Yeah, I have rehearsed stuff in my head. Um, that I would say in a given situation. But when it comes time where it's applicable to say the thing, if I go into fight or flight mode, the words don't come out of my mouth. Right. <laughs> so practicing the feeling of standing in your own power, um, not being rattled. Exactly. Is hugely important because my biggest issue in conflict is, and the reason that I try to avoid conflict is, is because I go into fight or flight mode quite easily. Yeah, and then you get dumb. You, you get you, dumb. You don't remember what you were going to say. Your entire argument starts to fall apart. So it's remembering the feeling. And also that's where allowing yourself to ask questions, allowing yourself to take a pause instead of bam, 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 yep. bam, just trading words, allowing yourself to say, like, give me a moment while I process what you said because maybe I am flustered or because maybe... I'm not in a place where I can fully understand. Allow yourself that pause. Whether or not the other person feels awkward about that, yep. um, it's perfectly fine not to have to be rapid fire at one another with the words. Well, for me, when it comes to the pause, especially, a lot of times what I realize is that if I'm in the midst of an argument, that the argument is actually, the, the it's almost like the two people there are arguing about two totally different things. Like they're having, they're not even paying attention to each other. They're just, saying what it is that they're going to say. And a lot of times when I take that opportunity to pause and stand back and the realization hits me that like, oh, this is not going anywhere. There, right. there is absolutely no point to this whatsoever. And that's where ask a lot of questions. What did you mean by that? Right. Why do you think you feel that way? Why do you believe that? Not just so that you could try to be on the same page, but maybe you could even learn something from one another and listening, but remaining skeptical, as you say. Right. And most importantly, uh, people get so lost in semantics, and I'm glad you covered that one. You could be arguing with somebody and 10 minutes goes by and you've gotten into arguing semantics and you're not even having the original argument yeah. anymore. And so where it's like, well, you said this and it's like, well, this is what I meant. Yeah, but that word means this. And yeah. then you're like sitting there just having an argument over the meaning of a word than an actual argument about what you were arguing about. I've been guilty countless of times of arguing semantics. And I would also grammar police in in the argument. This was a tactic I would use, admittedly, against my mom. Yeah, I would I would grammar police her in the middle of an argument and then we would fight about that. 
and it used to make her so mad, but it was um, it was so way for me to try to gain control, but it was hugely unproductive. Yeah, exactly. Um, so getting lost in semantics and the minutia of that form of argumenting never never benefits either party. No, and we all have we all have little tactics that we use because like I said, it's just a power play. If it looked like a video game to you, the two video game characters are just like yelling at each other, taking turns yelling at each other, and this one says this thing and then boom, this one's life goes up a little bit more and the other one's life goes mm-hmm. down. The more that you argue and you start feeling deflated, you know that you're the character that's about to get KO'd. Absolutely. So basically this whole thing And however you, uh, you know, everyone's got their own conflict resolution tactics. But this is basically, um, in regards to the art world or just life in general, things that we've put into practice, especially looking at for myself, to keep me out of fight or flight mode as much as possible and allow myself the breathing room to respond instead of react. And that's really what all this is about. It really is. It really is. Because when you start putting your artwork out there and like really putting it out there, you are going to face situations where there might be conflict that comes up or a conflict with a group, or maybe you're feeling alienated by this or alienated by that. And the way that you deal with it, where you keep your mindset with you, where you keep your wits about you instead mm-hmm. of like uh, losing your shit because uh, so-and-so said this about me or did that or whatever, and now I'm angry. Um, it's really, really avoiding the toxic people and understanding there are going to be conflicts, there are going to be disagreements, and I want to be on point when I'm dealing with them. Because that's going to be my place of power. And I got to tell you, there's nothing more intimidating than like you come at somebody and you're pissed and they're calm and they're actually listening to what you're saying and responding to what you're saying in like a rational manner. Then you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> they're asking you questions based on your your angry statements. Then you're in trouble. Yeah. Because then if you don't have substance behind what you're saying, your whole argument's going to fall apart. Yeah. I'm not saying that the art world is full of conflict. No. But humans, you no. know? So out at shows, at events, within co-op galleries, boy, are there some personalities, you yeah. know, everywhere. You're going to be you're going to be dealing with situations because you're dealing with other people. You're dealing with life. When I tell people like, yeah, being an artist, like it's almost like a lot of times they want the step one, step two, step three, step four. When in actuality, it's all just a series of experiences that you're having out there dealing with people, dealing with life. These kind of things, conflict resolution is very, very important because especially if you're putting doing shows Uh, You are uh, doing a juried art show, you're getting into a gallery, you're within a co-op gallery, you start something with other artist friends, uh, you run into an art critic, you're dealing with human beings out in the art world, and everybody's going to have a different motivation, you you want to be able to identify the bullies, you're going to want to be able to identify the toxic people in your life, you're going to want to identify the people that you really get along with, the ones that are supportive, And you're going to want to be able to resolve conflicts in a way where you still know who you are and you're standing in your own sense of power versus red flaming it up and just losing it and walking away from a situation uh, where the only way that you're going to get back to is by doing the walk of shame. Totally. I saw so many people at the market um, red flame out because they were upset about something. Red flame out on the market manager, and next thing you know, they're no longer at the market. They right. lost their spot. You right. know, <laughs> it's like escalating the situation um, is never, never good if you can help it. No, it never is. So yeah, so just remember, blue flame it up. Don't red flame it up. Unless, unless you need to. Yeah, unless you need to. If you need to red flame it up, go ahead and do that. But I would rely more on the blue flame. It's way more intense than the red flame. And that concludes this section of the audiobook. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. If you would like, you can proceed to the next section. Have an awesome day. Adios!